I want to welcome everybody here. I'm delighted to be here. My name is Mike Posner. I'm new to uh, NYU. I'm, uh, I've been here about six weeks, and I'm over at the Stern Business School uh, where I'll begin teaching in the fall and setting up a center on business and human rights. But that's not what I'm doing here today. Um, I uh, had uh, the uh, great fortune over the last three and a half years to work in the Obama administration in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, uh, where I was Assistant Secretary. And in the course of that, I visited China five or six times and uh, dealt with a whole range of issues. Um, we have a terrific panel here. I'm really the traffic cop. Um, and I want to uh, introduce them, but just to say, as I do, that the, I think the focus of what we're doing here this afternoon um, is looking in both in, inward and outward. Uh, China, the, the subject here, the title is China and the World, uh, Challenges and Opportunities, and I think we really are trying to look at both. There are obviously a range of challenges in the way China um, deals with issues of human rights domestically, um, but it's also a place that's changing very fast. And I think we want to recognize both the problems that exist, but also the ways in which people inevitably resilient Chinese people are beginning to address and, and challenge those, uh, those uh, violations. And then the second piece of this is really to look at what's the effect. China is such an important player in the world. And I think one of the things that we're really going to try to get into as we look outward is what's the effect of China as such an important global player? How are some of the things they're doing internally affecting their foreign policy? And in a broader sense, how does that affect the broader human rights discussion globally? We have three terrific panelists, uh, Professor uh, Fu Huelong from the University of Hong Kong, who's an expert on a range of things relevant to this, uh, criminal justice issues, rule of law, role of the courts, media, and also is very closely following the relationship between Hong Kong and China. Um, in a sense, I think he can open us up by saying, laying the groundwork and saying uh, some things about what's happening within China, what are some of the challenges we face and opportunities, uh, next, Jerry Cohn, who sits to my left, who's a, a stranger to no one in this room. He's been at NYU since 1990, but Jerry is really the dean of the uh, American legal community and its relationship to China. No one has done more than Jerry to uh, open up China in the eyes of the American legal community, um, both as a practicing lawyer at Paul Weiss for 20 years, as a professor here, for 20-some years with the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, he really has defined this territory, and I think Jerry's a good bridge between what's going on in China and what's going on in the global environment. And we're, uh, the third panelist, uh, Felice Gare, uh, from the Jacob Blaustein Institute for the Advancement of Human Rights at the American Jewish uh, Committee, has been, uh, as I, for a long time, involved uh, decades in the human rights world and in the global discussion. She's um, been very active at the United Nations, a uh, member of the UN Committee Against Torture. She's worked with the UN Association. She's worked on UNESCO issues. She's really followed probably more than any American the evolution of human rights at the United Nations. So we're going to start inside and head out. Um, and I'm going to ask each of the panelists to just say a few words by way of introduction. Last comment for me before I uh, yield the floor. I'm thrilled to be here in part because of NYU's commitment to human rights, human rights in China, linking the law and human rights, and in the name of Bob Bernstein, who's a personal hero of mine and longtime friend and mentor. Um, I know that uh, Bob um, has, me has done many great things, but I think this is really an important piece of Bob's contribution and, and Bill and others in the family obviously have helped. This is a great occasion. We're delighted to be here. And I'm going to ask Professor Fu if you will lead us off and set the table. Please. Thank you very much for the introduction. China has uh, uh, now the new government. We are all waiting 
uh, to see what happens in the next 10 years. Um, let me just go back a little bit um, uh, before I could speculate on what might happen in, in China. Chinese politics has this 10-year cycle now, just like the US politics has this eight-year cycle. Um, it started in 1979, Right, when this, uh, well, 1979 is important for China and important for me. That's the year I went to law school, so it's an important year. 79 is the beginning. Ten years, towards the end of the decade, there was, or there is, there will be a repressive moment. If you think about, it's 89, we know what happened in 89, right? We know what happened in 99. That's the suppression of the Falun Gong, that's the year. And we know what happened in 2009. That's the time when China really started to crack down on, on civil society. So the nine is a bad number for, for Chinese politics. Um, so um, towards the end was the repression. Right? Ten years, uh, Deng Xiaoping started reform, 88, 89, after, after many years. Then there was the crackdown. Then the second government, Jiang Zemin, uh, started rule for reform, did quite well in the middle of 1990s, but then all of a sudden, 98, 99, he became very conservative, in a way very repressive. Hu Jintao, of course, started you know, uh, end of uh, 2000, uh, um, 2002 and the beginning of 2003. He started to talk about constitutionalism uh, and for a year, and then he stopped. Um, towards uh, 90, uh, 2009, he became very brutal, very repressive. So somehow, uh, as if uh, towards the end of their uh, terms, uh, before they hand the power to the next generation, they are saying the power is in good order and it's your turn. A uh, few things I want to say as a matter of background. First, uh, there is high expectation, if not high trust, on central authorities. Chinese political reform, legal reform, is heavily a top-down process. People expect it, something to be happen by the new generation of leaders. It's, it's, there's a reliance on leaders. You may criticize uh, Wen Jiabao, Hu Jintao, for the bad 10 years. You look back, oh, Jiang Zemin's 10 years was not that bad. You are thinking about what would happen next 10 years, but then the expectation is fixed on high political office. That is a very interesting thing, in a way demonstrate this top-down hierarchical political order in China. Second, political leaders before they go to office um, want to do something, want to change, uh, want to improve uh, for, for different reasons. I, every generation of leaders start by talking about rule of law, even a little bit democracy, and they all talk about constitution or uh, constitutionalism as the new generation of leaders are now talking about constitutional reform. Why is that? Well, I think there are two reasons. First, there are, there are the uh, new uh, uh, boys uh, in, in the game. They are more vulnerable. Uh, they, they are the relative weaker party in the political game. They are entrenched interest. And uh, as a weaker party, they tend to rely on institutions, rule of law, to uh, beef up their position, right, to strengthen their position. And secondly, I think they genuinely believe there is something they could do, and they also want to do something. When Hu, Jin, when Hu Jintao and uh, Xi Jinping say, we want to do constitutional reform, I, personally, I think they mean what they say. Right? That's, once they send out the signal, societies receive the signal and they start to mobilize. Right? When uh, Xi Jinping says we want to have a constitutional reform, again, people start to believe what he is saying and society becomes mobilized, you, 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 you march, you organize, you mobilize, and then sooner or later you think you hit this war, right? Because since 1979, uh, the the reform agenda in China is that will be the reform under the Communist Party's leadership. Right? That is the parameter and that uh, a larger framework cannot be challenged. But 
for the civil society forces since when they started the uh, reform, the, when they have their initiation, uh, it's very difficult to avoid this very important political question. Um, so as it will happen, or as it has happened in the past, first two years will be interesting uh, uh, period of time. We often call this honeymoon period. The political leaders talk about the rule of law, talk about the political reform, and the society will, will respond that to that very actively and sometimes aggressively. Uh, after three, four, five years, uh, the, the political leader would say that is too challenging and that is too risky. And if we want to keep the existing political system, the reform has to be suspended and uh, stopped. Uh, if you push a bit further, then you would have um, what has happened a few years ago, the lawyers disappeared, imprisoned. So that is the cycle uh, I want to talk about. So we are at the beginning, the, the, the last 10 years, of course, just finished. Uh, last, uh, now we're at the beginning of, of a new era. Uh, one interesting thing, I, before I finish, I'm happy to answer questions later on, is uh, the reform period was much longer. Deng Xiaoping had almost 10 years to talk about reform. Uh, Jiang Zemin about six years. Uh, Hu Jintao had two years of reform. Right? Our worry about Xi Jinping is he, he only had about one year or six months. He probably has finished his reform already. <laughs> so it's getting shorter and shorter. So uh, I think I will just stop here first. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>